My name is Dr. Don Motika, and I'm a board-certified family practice physician. This program is dedicated to introducing you to a new way of looking at the science of health and disease. We call it functional medicine. You're not alone if you're dissatisfied with the fact that medicine we receive has turned into a name it, blame it, tame it, healthcare delivery conveyor belt. It seems as if very few are focused on actually helping people heal, but instead are only focused on patching them up, but never really getting to the essence of why they were ill in the first place. Functional medicine is different. It focuses on the individual as a unique system and looks for ways to support healing and avoid ongoing injury. In this half hour, we're going to talk about the basis of illness and how it relates to the basic principles of functional medicine. What I'm going to call conventional medicine is the regular medical care that you might get if you go for a blood pressure check or to an urgent care. It's fundamentally about reacting to disease. Now, if you have appendicitis, you want somebody to react to your appendicitis and potentially remove your appendix. That is the appropriate response. But if you have diabetes, you cannot act exactly remove the diabetes. And there is the problem with conventional medicine. It works really well for typhoid fever or appendicitis or other things that are essentially an invasion from the outside. It works really well for trauma, which is essentially an injury caused by some outside force applied to the body. And it is, in fact, the preferable approach to these sorts of events. But as we approach the middle of the 21st century, we can say that most of the diseases we encounter are not, in fact, diseases of trauma or diseases of infection, but more subtle diseases of disrupted systems, both internal and external to the individual. It is in that systems biology that functional medicine has ascendancy over conventional medicine. Functional medicine can be framed as approaching any disease or complaint with the two following questions in mind. Number one, does this individual at this time have an excess or overload of something which is triggering the symptoms? And number two, does this individual at this time have a deficiency or insufficiency of something that is allowing these symptoms to be triggered? If you conceive of a disease as an invasion from some outside influence into a perfectly healthy individual, then functional medicine makes no sense. But if you frame chronic disease as a situation where either excesses of some things or deficiencies of others are destabilizing the individual, then this approach makes perfect sense. I'm not here to beat up on conventional medicine. I use pharmaceuticals and surgical strategies to treat many of my patients, but when these fail, Functional medicine gives me a few more techniques that can get that stressed system back on an even keel. Both forms of medicine are valid, and the key is applying the appropriate form in the appropriate context. Another important principle is the idea of genetic variation. We all of us contain at least dozens and more commonly hundreds of variations in the way that our enzymes are built. A single slip of the genetic code can make an enzyme 10 or 100 times more or less effective at its action. There's plenty of redundancy in this system. Those of us who do not have enough redundancy to compensate never make it through gestation, let alone into adulthood. But some of us adults still have higher requirements for certain nutrients relative to the general population because of these small genetic variations. A classic example of this is the methylation enzymes associated with folic acid. Look at this system of gears. Some people cannot convert folic acid into its methylated form and need to take methylated folic acid in order to drive the enzyme forward. Other people cannot methylate B12 and need B12 to drive their reactions forward. There is a complicated biochemical dance coming in all of these chemical reactions, and any change in the tempo of a particular enzyme's ability to transmit throughput will have an effect on the efficiency of that individual's metabolism. Think about people in a square dance. How well is that group going to do if one of the dancers has a sprained ankle? Just one dancer in these complex enzyme reactions is enough to make the entire activity slow way down. There is no standard issue human. There are somewhere around 30,000 genes, and small genetic variations exist in all of these genes. If you're alive right now, your variations did not kill you. But at least 25% of fertilized eggs die because of errors, mistakes, and mutations that simply will not let you be viable. About one in four babies that are born have an identifiable somatic defect that is something you can see. So therefore, everyone has defects. And how they tr defects in how they break down drugs, defects in how they form collagen defects, perhaps, in how they process cholesterol. 
Conventional medicine uses a mythical average human being. This mythical average is a byproduct of how we think about science. We use the scientific method, which was designed to study physical phenomena like the behavior of gases or the behavior of electricity, and it was co-opted by pharmaceutical manufacturers in the early 20th century to study drugs, and now it's run amok and has completely contaminated our thinking such that we cannot perform logical analysis without resorting to this concept, the double-blind placebo-controlled trial, which just does not work when you have to, got individual genetic variation interfering with your basic assumption that everyone is more or less the same in terms of their needs and responses. Our drugs, for the most part, are what worked for 70 kilogram, 25 year old Caucasian males because until recently that's who they did the science on. Those were medical students and graduate students and people you could pay to allow themselves to be experimented upon. This is not going to work for a 75 year old African American female. But the physician's drug reference and the medical establishment barely acknowledge this variation. It's not a racist issue. It's not a sexist issue. It's a fundamental blind spot in contemporary scientific method. Functional medicine at least acknowledges these issues and creates a framework for coming to grips with them. It's not fully developed, it's not definitive, but it's a decent place to start to unravel this complexity because it approaches the complexity from a systems perspective. With this in mind, let's come back to the basic functional medicine principles. They would work as follows. The requirements for health and the problems that cause disease vary from individual to individual. So when confronted with an unhealthy individual, the first question to ask from a functional medicine perspective are what's def a deficiency and what's an excess? Differences in the two approaches to chronic disease in particular. There are drugs that you can take for a specific complaint, such, uh, such as chronic fatigue or irritable bowel or achy joints or fatigue, but there is instead in functional medicine an approach to identify what might be deficient in this individual and supplement it, what might be in excess and reduce or redistribute it or detoxify it. From there comes the treatment for the disease. It is not a one-size-fits-all approach because it assumes the differences are not caused by an external agent but by a disruption of the normal internal balance. In order to sort this out, we in functional medicine use a series of tools. The first of these is the timeline, which looks at what begins with the parents and the grandparents and the genetic predispositions that may be present, as best we can ascertain them from the history. Then we look at the prenatal influences, the circumstances of the mother and the father's nutrition and stress at the time of conception, and then the course of the pregnancy, the use of antibiotics, what were the stress levels, what genetic imprinting occurred through the mechanism that we now call epigenetics. Nature is all about survival. Epigenetics is a programmed anticipation that modifies the DNA in the short term. It's not a mutation. Mechanisms in the DNA listen to the environment before birth and essentially decide what the universe is going to be like for that fetus and modify the basic equipment of the fetus to react appropriately to those circumstances. Once born into the world, these environmental experiences continue to magnify and some genes and silence others throughout our lives. Other influences can be nurtured or interfered with normal development. A good example is the use of antibiotics in a premature infant or the absence of the appropriate probiotic imprinting at the time of birth because of a C-section or from the failure to breastfeed. Influences that have long-term impacts on some individuals that are very obvious from a functional medicine perspective. I will not go into great detail into the concept of epigenetics except to say that our genome is like a book like an encyclopedia, epigenetics are marginal notes, paper clips that close off segments of the genome or prevent them from being read, highlighters that amplify segments of the genome and cause them to receive undue attention, Xerox copies of a certain page popped into the book in order to amplify the number of potential readers of that particular segment of DNA. All of this goes on as a result of environmental influences. As we go through the timeline in the matrix, we want to know what could be the potential triggers. Did a person's multiple sclerosis develop after her divorce? Did it develop when she moved to Alaska? Did it develop after a period of disordered eating? All of these influences are triggers that could be important to understand. A trigger can be like a match thrown into a dry field of grass. The dry grass has been there for years, but it's not until someone carelessly throws a match that that field flares up and creates a disease. 
There are vulnerabilities like hairline cracks in the structure of a person's physiology, but they don't necessarily become a disease because they're not triggered. So the timeline helps us identify the triggers, and from there we have a sense of what the disease, what the hairline crack may have been. And from there, of course, we can start to figure out how we might patch that crack or ameliorate or block further progression of the disease. Of examples of this might be a bronchitis that causes the use of oral antibiotics that then interferes with the bowel flora and causes a flare of colitis. Another example would be a loss or a bereavement leading to sleep deprivation and sadness, causing a shift in the steroid hormones and the neurotransmitters leading to chronic fatigue or depression. Maybe the person has a great deal of dental work, gets rid of all their amalgam fillings, and that raises their heavy metal threshold above a certain point poisons their mitochondria, and they develop chronic fatigue. Then there are the things called perpetuators that we might think about which is present that influences resilience in the individual. So things that fuel the breakdown in resilience could be poor diet, poor social support, bad relationship, work stress, maybe a toxic overload relative to their genetics. A good example of this would be a person who tells me they have lots of side effects to many different pharmaceuticals. Another would be a person who has different reactions to a lot of different foods. It rapidly gets complicated. So we're going to talk now about the functional medicine matrix, which is basically a tool that we use to help us think about what might be going wrong in an individual. So we divide things up into these categories. We have assimilation and elimination. We have structural, we have communication, we have transport, detoxification and transformation, energy, and defense and repair. We're going to take some of these categories, not all of them today. So let's start with assimilation and elimination. We assimilate by breathing. We breathe in oxygen and we breathe out and eliminate carbon dioxide. That's one of our basic functions. We orally assimilate water and food. We have to digest it, break it down, absorb it, but only absorb the stuff we want. And we also have to keep all of the bacteria in our gut from getting into our bloodstream. So we talk in terms of assimilation as this process of taking things from the environment, incorporating them safely into our body, and then elimination, getting rid of the things that we need to, that we've used up or perhaps otherwise created that can't be allowed to stay because they would become toxic. Then we move to the concept of structure and start to think of that as membranes, membranes in the gut, membranes at the blood-brain barrier, the skin. The purpose of membranes is to keep some things out and let other things in. Then think about other structural issues. Is there a scar that interferes with lymphatic drainage, allowing for the accumulation of fluid or toxins in a particular body tissue? Is there a problem with the joints or the musculoskeletal system that interferes with movement? Because movement is key to life. Exercise is vitamin X. We all need to move, and you die when you stop moving. So structure is extremely important. Then we have to communicate. And for our purposes, we primarily think of communication as the endocrine system, and that's your thyroid, your pancreas, your ovaries, your testes, your, your adrenal glands, and it all communicates by signals, hormones, also your neurotransmitters. There's really no difference between your brain neurotransmitters and hormones, and in fact, many of them are interchangeable. And this complex signaling is key to keeping the organism well-regulated. Then we move to biotransformation. And this is the process of taking one thing and turning it into something else. We have to take our estrogen and detoxify it, make it inactive so that it stops its signaling purpose, and then eliminate it from the body. And that elimination ties in with what's going on in the intestines, and it ties in in what's going on in the liver. A good example here would be tamoxifen. If you do not have a particular enzyme active in your liver, you cannot make tamoxifen prevent your breast cancer, or you cannot make tamoxifen block estrogen and therefore help you not progress in your breast cancer. Again, we know this to be true, but women are not universally tested for the mutations in their 2D6 enzyme, 
when they have breast cancer. This is the enzyme that converts tamoxifen into the active ingredient. They clearly should be, but this is not part of conventional medicine yet. The other frightening thing about these pharmaceuticals is that they combine with each other, impact those detoxification and deactivation mechanisms in the liver in unpredictable ways, such that if you try to model them mathematically, if there are more than three drugs going in a single individual, the possibilities for interactions become astronomical. Over 100,000 people a year in the United States alone die from appropriately administrated drugs that simply go wrong because the individual doesn't have the right enzyme to break them down or because they are taking other drugs that interfere with the appropriate behavior of that enzyme. The final category we'll discuss today is defense and repair. While a well-regulated militia is fundamental to the protection of the state, an unregulated militia is like a bunch of people running around with automatic weapons firing them off in movie theaters. That unregulated militia, my friends, is the autoimmune system and allergies. In these poorly regulated militia, an individual's immune system goes after harmless molecules because, well, they're paranoid. Psychological stress can raise the threshold for this immune reaction, such that people develop food allergies and food sensitivities when they are under periods of high stress. This is an absolutely documented scientific fact. We know this happens. We can induce it in rats, and we see it all the time in humans. The intestine, the microbiome, those bacteria, the good ones and the bad ones, are fundamental players in your body's defenses. And if you are inoculated in early childhood with appropriate bacteria, you are less likely to have allergies because your immune system knows who the good guys are and knows who the bad guys are and doesn't go around attacking innocent bystanders. The fact that giving probiotics to children with asthma or eczema reduces their symptoms shows, as far as I'm concerned, that very indisputably, this is all connected. And a medicine that tries to understand how everything is connected, rather than a medicine that tries to separate everything into component parts, well, I'm sorry. But I think the first one is going to be more effective. The matrix that we use and the functional medicine concepts is not about splitting things up. It's a tool for identifying where to try and make a change. You're looking at a complex dynamic trying to understand it, and then being strategic about where you're going to plant your foot, plant your lever, and push, and try to shift an individual from a bad dynamic in the direction of a healthier dynamic. Conventional medicine does infections beautifully. Sepsis, pneumonia, appendectomy. If I have a bacteria in my bloodstream, I do not want to take herbs or get counseling. I want drugs because I want to swat that bacteria before it triggers an immune storm and kills me. If I have a broken leg, a birth defect, or a blood clot in my left popliteal artery, I want conventional medicine to deal with my structural issues. Conventional medicine is less able to tackle social issues, chronic lifestyle-related diseases like diabetes or hypertension, and it also doesn't work well for the outliers, those who deviate from the average, like people with environmental sensitivity, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Conventional medicine has done its work so well that guess what? Those are the issues that would confront us in 2015 in epidemic proportions. These issues are exactly the ones that call for a fresh perspective that functional medicine brings. that the opinions expressed on this program represent those of the speakers and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, or its contributors. Furthermore, the purpose of this program is education and entertainment. It is not intended as a substitute for professional consultation.